Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, part three of the philosophy of building a house. Now, tonight I want to explore the great subject of, hey, I'm funding myself. I'm doing it myself. I'm going to go experimental, right? I'm going to go crazy. There's all these different approaches to building a house, and I think it's great. And nothing I say tonight, I hope, will discourage anybody from pursuing this. But I just think um, there's a lot of ways to think about this. And again, the notion of what you're trying to accomplish and what it means to accomplish that, I think, is very important to keep in mind. And there's lots of <clears throat> variables that I think are sometimes underappreciated or misunderstood when people think about this. So uh, in this approach, basically, if you don't have a bank, which means you're paying for it yourself, you're liberated from a huge number of constraints. Because like I said before, the bank is always going to fund something that they think they can resell. And what they think they can resell is the kind of house that everybody else has. They love tracked homes because they know they sell. They know they sell because they build a lot of them and they sell. So it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. <clears throat> I don't think it's so much that people necessarily only want tracked homes, but banks certainly only want tracked homes. So what you get to choose from is generally tracked homes. And, <laughs> and you see how this uh, cycle repeats and then everybody goes, well, you know, that's what the market wants. And it's like, well, if you consider the market to be banks and notice that banks don't actually live in houses, banks are not people. And so there's this weird disconnect between the uh, forces that shape the um, spaces that we inhabit often, our homes, and the values that we may hold individually or even communally, there's a huge disconnect between what people want, what they like, and what actually gets built, and then what people sort of have to buy because this is what banks will fund, and most people don't have the resources to purchase things that they can't take a loan out on. Plus, there's all kinds of financial advantages to loans in the United States, but you know, that's another story. <clears throat> so you've liberated yourself from this because you've, you've saved up money somehow um, and you have the resources and you're just going to go crazy. You can do, there's so many different approaches and somewhere in uh, the great collection of lectures that Alan Watts has, you know, I, by the way, I'm never convinced that he's talking about Buddhism or Taoism or whatever his a, a potential subject is, but I certainly like what he talks about, right? So is he, it's Wattism, right? Like, I'm, I'm not sure about the level of scholarship. I, you know, you can pick a, a few bones with this and that, but boy, he, d he does say interesting things. So, you know, not, not throwing stones at him on that front. Um, but he does make this comment that he doesn't understand bedrooms. He says, I hate bedrooms. Why do people have bedrooms? Waste of space. What's the point? You can sleep on the couch. You can sleep on the floor. Why do we have all this space set aside that we just sleep in, right? And I remember thinking, wow, that's an interesting insight. Not because I don't like bedrooms, because I do love the bedroom, um, but because we are just so naturally inclined culturally um, in the United States to that space. In fact, bedrooms is one of the primary selling it. How many bedrooms does have you? How many bedrooms? It doesn't seem to matter how many people you have. You have a lot of people living one person in three and four bedroom homes. This is totally normal in the United States. In fact, I think the number is that half of suburban homes, which are going to be three or four bedrooms, have one occupant. So for some reason, we've just decided bedrooms are good. Ipso facto, more bedrooms are better, um, even if we live by ourselves. So you know, so it's sort of become this crazy cultural thing. And it's like, wow, you know, if you want, if you have the money and you don't need to go through a bank, you don't even have to have a bedroom. Just forget the bedroom. Like, forget it completely. Who cares? Who wants bedroom? Who wants roofs? We don't need roofs. Roofs just keep all the fresh air and rain out, right? So you can do anything you want, right? Uh, however, uh, there are a few constraints, unfortunately. One, of course, physics, always the enemy of creativity. Uh, two... Most places, not every place, uh, codes will intervene and codes will have a big determinant factor. And there's sort of a joke that if you have enough money, there are no codes, which is to say you can get around just about anything with a sufficient amount of cash. But if you don't have a lot of cash, then what you end up doing is having to <clears throat> sort of negotiate what you want. Now you don't have to worry about banks, but you do still have to worry about building codes. Because again, most places in the United States, and I would assume most, many other places in the world, you you if you don't have if you don't meet code, it's illegal to occupy the space. And then this becomes variable. There are some counties where this is not true. Also, you know how far you are away from inspectors. Are your neighbors likely to say anything? You know these are all variables. So if you don't have to worry about codes, then you're just liberated even further. 
But assuming you you are going to build something that is code uh, ish, or at least code ish, right? Code light perhaps would be the way to say that. You do have an actual constraint, but you can still do an amazing amount of of, of work and of creativity and of approach of approaches that uh, you would never be able to do if you were funded by a bank. And this brings me to sort of the first caveat I would like to say is when you start looking at alternative building methods, the thing they like to talk about, I think first and foremost is like how the walls are built, you know, uh, straw bale construction, <clears throat> rammed earth construction, uh, where they fill tires sometimes in rammed earth, they do that, use old tires and fill them with rammed earth. That's great. Straw bale construction, that's great. Uh, wood construction, where you put dry wood on end and then sort of fill in usually with concrete or some sort of uh, heavy fiber. Um, I mean, there's just so many different approaches. Uh, timber frame, right, is a different way of framing uh, walls and your structure. And it's all great. I'm in, in favor of all of this. Again, often this is presented, uh, I think, incorrectly. Now, I don't think I know. I know incorrectly as being cheaper and um, easier. Neither of these is the case. In, in, in both cases, in, in whatever alternative method you use, what you're doing is you're leaving the norm. And when you leave the norm, you immediately run into a couple of problems. One is you leave the world of mass manufacturing. And I can give you an example from an experiment I ran. Where I live, uh, we have a lot of, it's mostly glacial tilth as our soil. So that means we have a lot of very round granite stones, somewhere between the size of a softball and a large watermelon. And of course, there's some bigger ones and there's some smaller ones, but we have a lot that between like a softball and a big watermelon. And I thought, these are beautiful. You should be able to build a rock wall with these and or in other, lots of rock things with them. And almost no one uses them here. I mean, like to the point of no one. And I researched and looked and tried to find ways to use these beautiful stones in construction. And finally, I just had to do a experimentation, come up with a method, talk to a lot of people. I read a lot of books. I couldn't find really anything on there. And I sort of did a a strange kind of modified slip form. I had to develop like a new sort of mortar. It was all great and fun and interesting. And it allowed me to use our local products, which were essentially free. Some mortar, which is very cheap and sand, which is very cheap and readily because we have glacial tilth. So, and I was able to build some stone foundations and stem walls and walls and, and, and stuff. And that was great, but it wasn't cheap. I probably spent you know, 100, 200 hours researching and experimenting. I don't know, it was 200 hours at least now that I think about it. Just researching, experimenting, trying out mortars, different pouring strategies, different slip form strategies until I found one that I thought was beautiful and functional and, and, and could, you know, be, be made effective and, and could reproduce. So on one hand, the materials were quote unquote cheap, but when you spend 200 hours, that's not, well, it means I'm paying, you know, I'm not paying myself, so I guess that's cheap. But so you have to, change your mind frame and go, okay, you know, um, now I'm not, I'm leaving the world of ready-made where you can just get a YouTube video, look at it, learn how to do it. And it's done. Or the professionals will come on site and go, oh, I can tell you how to do that. I know how to do that. You know, when you start doing experiments, when you start getting outside the norm, you immediately run into this, which is both the great opportunity and the great learning opportunity, but it's also, you're, it's not cheap. It's, and it's not a Efficient, if you know, efficient in the least useful word of efficient. It's very efficient in learning, building something unique, and 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 seeing your dreams come to life. It's not efficient time, or generally speaking, even money wise. Um, another example is when people like straw bale construction, which is great. You know, this huge R factor. That's amazing. You know, gives you those beautiful deep window sills. Here's the thing: if you do all the framing yourself, you're going to have to figure out how to put windows and windowsills into these beautiful deep windowsills and they're just completely abnormal and so like you know how you install windows and how you do everything around that is just going to be different so it's going to slow things down or if you call electricians in if, you know electricity is magic that's one thing i don't know how to do because who, who uh, that's for the professionals um they'll probably be happy to do it but it's going to slow them down a little bit they're going to go ooh. They probably haven't done straw bale houses. And so they're going to have to think about it a lot more. They're going to have to go more slowly. They'll probably be a little nervous. They'll probably increase the bid because they're unfamiliar with it. They may even do an open-ended bid. Say, look, we don't know how long it's going to take us. So our bid will be materials plus, which is perfectly reasonable. 
Um, but you're just, it'll be a c- continual cycle of this. The inspectors are going to lose their minds unless they're in some place where this happens a lot. They're probably going to, if, if you're going by code, then they're going to want to inspect it. They're, you know, they're not going to be happy. They're going to keep creating problems and not understand. And you'll probably have to go through the code with them. And, and, it, and again, it's not, I don't want to blame them. It's just, they're probably overscheduled. They don't understand it. They get nervous. <clears throat> and so then you pay the price. And so it will be this continual sequence of these events once you leave the norm. Um, Again, an architect can be hugely helpful here, particularly one who may specialize in in what you're doing uh, so that they can help you, if nothing else, like get through the inspection process. You can, you know, make this work. And so, again, I'm I'm entirely in favor of it. In fact, again, as I started with, we build houses for banks, not for people. And when you leave that environment, it gives you an opportunity to build a home for a person, for you, uh, that you can inhabit, that your dreams can be in. But it, it's weirdly difficult to build for people as in yourself as opposed to for a bank because the whole thing is set up to, to, to build for banks. And so you're going to run into this. And generally what it amounts to is time. You're really going to have to put a lot of time in which is usually the great part about like, this is the dream. I'm going to set aside some time in my life. I've saved up some resources. Let's go, let's do this magic thing. But, but, but you need to get your mind that way so that you're, you know, if you're trying to make a a rush, it will be an endless, endless series of frustrations and something that can be beautiful and a great experience because you're feeling pressed. uh, Can you can just take a lot of the joy out of it? I think it's, is it Philip Larkin who says, Haste is the destroyer of beauty. I think it might be Larkin. Uh, Anyway, some poet, somewhat like Larkin, has a line that says, you know, haste is is the destroyer of beauty and joy. And I think this is true. Um, And that's what you'll encounter when you kind of leave the well-trodden path. The other, or another aspect that I think is often underappreciated, and this is the invisible nature. Uh, Again, if our minds are so inculcated in in with the spaces we've inhabited in the systems that we're used to that we often don't what we don't see and what we don't experience directly often leaves our mind so we live in these spaces we like air we like light we like cozy maybe we like wood maybe we like adobe whatever it is and we think about those what we tend not to think about is infrastructure what makes spaces inhabitable and um, when you look at the cost of spaces, the, the building structure itself is generally not as much of the cost of a project as you would expect. So when people talk about walls and, you know, say, hey, you do straw bale walls. And let's say the entire thing, straw bales were free. All the framing was free. All the plastering that you usually do with straw bale construction is free. Let's say everything is free. And the labor, this will save you about you know, 15% of the project cost, which means 85% won't go away. And that's what, and of course it won't be free. You'll have to do the framing wood, et cetera, et cetera. But even if it were, you would still only be saving, quote unquote, saving again from last lecture, about 15% of the cost. So it's not insignificant, but where the hell else does all this money go? Like what's it going for? And I really notice this when you see the tiny homes. I love the tiny home videos, right? Like I'm just fascinated by them. These people take maybe two or 300 square feet. They build these little jewel boxes often, you know, for them, custom for them. They really have a sense that they love the space and it's designed for how they want to live. And it's like, great, good for you. I'm again, totally in favor of this. But usually they'll say, oh, well, I built this for only whatever, $60,000. And I go, wow, you so see you built 200 square feet for $60,000, which is $300, square, $300 a square foot, which is, you know, not cheap, not super expensive relative to current building costs, but also not super cheap. Ah, but what they leave out usually, not invariably, but usually is all the stuff that really matters. And so if you're thinking about doing a project like this, don't start with, all that, the, the visible things, the things that you can touch and feel so much. Uh, although that's a great place to start. I shouldn't say don't start. Start wherever the hell you want. Don't listen to me. Um, but in the process of thinking about it, please consider that what makes these spaces habitable and comfortable tends to boil down to 
heat, water, sewer, and electricity. <clears throat> those are those are the big four. If if and you can you don't you know none of these are necessary by, by, by the way. You can get rid of them, but those are you know those are huge variables and now you're definitely not code. But if you if you look through that and you go okay, to put in a, a septic system, let's say if you're out of the city, or to tie into a septic system. By the way, most cities, not mo many, many, many cities, do not allow tiny homes to tie into set their systems. So this is a big problem in a lot of places. If you're in a county and you want to tie into a septic system, well, a septic system is going to be, you know, in most places, thirty thousand is if you're lucky, you know, probably fifty and up, and. You, so that's one. And then you have to have water. Well, if you're in the city, you can tie into the existing system. That's not too expensive usually, but take some groundwork and water and you have to buy a meter and do all this kind of things. Assuming they'll let your tiny house do this, often they won't. If you're in the county, now you're talking about a well. Wells are, you know, X. <laughs> wells are an unknown quantity. It depends on where you are, lots of variables. But well, pump house, blah, blah. So let's say you're at, you know, again, they get lucky and it's 30,000. So now you're... 60 to 80,000 for well and water. And of course, now you have to have power to run those. So now you have to run electrical in. And again, usually these contractors will not do this work without permits and you can't get permits without designs and plans. And so this is why code and permitting becomes this big maze that you have to wind your way through. But all of which is to say a huge part of the cost, even if you have a beautiful, perfectly wonderful, your dream $80,000 tiny home, if you want power and, and, and heat and water, you're probably and sewer, you're probably looking at another eighty to to $100,000 for those. And often these tiny homes, people say, oh, I'm in my friend's space or I'm renting a, a person's helping me out and whatever, which is great. Communal living, entirely in favor for it. But just know that somebody else has carrying those costs, right? This is not cost free. It just means you've transferred them someplace else, which may be fine. Like I said, communal living, pay them a little bit every month. Hey, everybody's a winner. But when thinking about spaces, definitely spend some time on this. If, if you're willing to do without one of these, like you want to do an outdoor composting toilet, this saves a fortune. Again, usually not code, so this is a huge barrier, but it also introduces that level of, um, you know, for Americans, this tends to create some social tension, some awkwardness, because we're just not what people are used to. Uh, again, not, a, not opposed to it anyway, have used them, liked them, you know, it doesn't, doesn't bother me. And again, when you consider that, you know, humanity lived for several thousand years without having the modern sewer and septic systems in place, uh, you know, it's, it can work perfectly well. But there is also a very good reason why we put modern sewer and septic systems in place because, you know, hello, cholera and other fine things. If, if too many people are in a too small a space and they aren't, you know, taking care of their waste properly. Same thing with water. Having running water is really, really nice. Um, where, where we live, a lot of people, not a lot, a, a significant number of people, I would say a few hundred at least, probably up in maybe around a thousand, which our, our, our county only has about 30,000 people. So, you know, a, a fair percentage of the population, um, don't, they don't have wells. And so what they use is they truck water. And so these people usually have a truck with a water tank in back. And then they, when the water gets low, they drive it to wherever they're filling, fill up the tank, and then they drive it back and park the truck because water is really heavy. Uh, I think it's, it's about eight pounds a gallon, something like that. And if you're using 10 gallons a day or 20 gallons a day, which is no problem, that's low. Even if you're careful and using, say, 10 or 20 gallons a day, and if you have two people, now you're at 40 gallons a day, that's 300 pounds of water you know, here we go, you, you know, it doesn't, you know, in a week you're, you're into tons, right? A couple of months and you're, it's a lot of water. So, um, that's one system that people use, but now you have the cost of a dedicated vehicle, usually a heavy, you know, a truck that can carry some weight. Uh, the tanks aren't that expensive, but still they need to be, you know, proper, appropriately attached. And so that's one way people get around it. Another thing people do where in our area is propane for heat. Um, because it does get coolish in the winter, and so it's nice to have that backup heat and be able to use that as a source of, of power um, if, if you need to, and cooking, and so these sorts of things. But it's just when you think about the systems, these are things you want to think about very carefully because a lot of the costs associated 
with both meeting code and bringing in the power and the electricity and, and so on is it, are those systems that we don't see because we're so used to them. Like, oh, I'll just run the dryer that will dry my clothes. And it's an incredible invention. Wow. Well, that's just electricity, and it's a lot of electricity. These are This is 220. This is pulling a lot of power. Hard to run it with solar unless you have a very sophisticated solar system, although that's great, too, if you have it. So you, you know, you don't have to do this. People did not have dryers for many centuries, many thousands of years. We lived perfectly well without dryers. However, it's a lifestyle choice, and you have to say, oh, if I'm not going to bring in, maybe I'll have just solar for running, you know, minimal power systems like light and, you know, maybe charge my computer or something like this. Yeah, that's easy. You want to drive a dryer. Ooh, yeah, that's not easy in any stretch of the imagination. And so thinking about all of these systems will help you, I think, uh, have a much better experience. And, and remember, you know, that it takes that we're so used to it that it really is a, an alternate lifestyle if, if you leave some of these systems behind, which again, fully endorse, like the, the take, take, take that by the hand and, and, and go with it if that's the dream and have that experience. So those two constraints, like understanding that, um, you know, efficiency is the efficiency of the dream, not of cost or, or time, because it's, it's just probably not going to work out that way way and that where the cost really exists are in those systems that we rarely think about um, when, unless we really start to, to work on a project like this. Having said that and having looked at those systems and really thought about it, I do think the magic of this project is just the inverse of what I said. If you are doing a lot of it yourself, and, and involving a community to help you, by the way, usually you can't do this entirely by yourself, although some people do on small projects, good on them. But that process of involving the community, doing yourself and really achieving a dream that's kind of outside the norm breaks the patterns. This is precisely, you know, in a way it is the, it's part of the function of the experience. If you decide, hey, we're going to just live completely with solar pa power, um, we're not going to bring in electricity because it's either way too far away, would be ridiculously expensive, or we just decide we're going to go 100% renewable and not worry about it. That's great. And then you can, you'll, you'll, you know, in working out what you have to do to achieve that, you'll realize, A, how stupid, you know, because we made power cheap and available, we just use it, right? Like we just, you know, make inefficient appliances and yeah, just, we don't care, right? Because it's relatively cheap and it's relatively available. And, you know, if you need more, you just get more, it just come, there's, you know, more comes through the wall. And so it's like, well, what do I have to worry about it? But in countries where electricity is super expensive or unavailable, you realize like, oh, look, there's, you know, very much more, I mean, like, wow, more efficient appliances that you can get. Of course, when you start looking at these, you realize like, oh, now we're paying this incredible premium because it's cheap and easy to build wildly inefficient and huge things. And for some reason, it costs a fortune to import, you know, these, you know, Japanese uh, dryer, washer dryer units that are incredibly energy efficient and small and work perfectly well. Japan seems to get by, but ouch, right? Like th th and then you pay that little extra cost there, which may be great. So, you know, th that breaking of patterns, I would say, don't be afraid of that. Like think long and hard about it, maybe experiment with it, try living uh, with a composting toilet at a regular house. Maybe in a regular house you want to move out in the country, you don't want to have a regular bathroom. Shoot, you know, don't let the neighbors know, but, you know, put a composting toilet out in the backyard and try it out for a while and see how see how it works, right? See if you like it or if you go, man, no, like I just, I'm just not there. This is not adding quality to my life. I want I want this. There's a great passage in Jinichiro Tanitsaki's, I'm saying his name wrong, uh, in Praise of Shadow, where he, in Praise of Shadows, where he talks about the way old Japanese bathrooms used to work and they would be outside of the house and you would, he would get up at night to go to the bathroom and that you would have cedar boughs in the sort of urinal and you would pee on the cedar boughs. And he said he loved that experience because it would be cold. It would be starlight. You would be forced to go outside at night and, and you know, the cedar boughs and he just said he, he loved that, but the second that he got an indoor bathroom, of course, he, he, who wants to go outside in the cold and 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 do that? And so sometimes if, if we change our patterns, we force ourselves to do things that 
we actually enjoy more that bring more pleasure to us, even though they may be less comfortable because, you know, there's comfort and there's comfort. Like, where does comfort come from? It comes from us living in patterns to which we have become accustomed. This doesn't mean these patterns were designed for us because they weren't. Again, our houses are by and large designed for banks, not for human beings. And so we get, but we get accustomed to living in banks and that pattern to break that with, with some experiment in materials or form or, or design is really, you know, I think it's just wonderful and amazing, but notice it's also going to be a challenge because so much of, of how we live, the way we live is, you know, we're, we're used to it. Like yurts, for instance, no people live in yurts and they just say it's very different to live in something that's a circle. We build squares. We know how to build circles. Building circles is not a big deal, although we're just so used to having everything be at right angles that, you know, again, if you want to build something that's permanent, not, you know, like shaped like a yurt, but is, you know, structural and permanent, you know, it's going to be hard because everything is about making things squares. It's like trying to work with round rocks. All the things about building rocks are about square rocks. I'm like, sure, I can put a square rock on top of a square rock. Okay, how about basketball shaped rocks? Now we're talking. You know, but we can build spherical, we can build domes, we can build circles, we can build curves. We know how to do this. This is not that difficult in one way, but it's sufficiently outside the norm that if you try to build a curving snake like wall, which might be very pleasing and incredibly cool, whew, it's not going to be time efficient, right? We're going to, it's going to take some experimenting. People are going to have trouble. Uh, builders aren't going to like it. It's, 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 it's amazing how you don't know, just vary a little bit and everybody gets edgy because uh, they're like, Ooh, like we don't know how to do this, right? This is just not what we're familiar with. So both in systems and materials and forms and functions, uh, I think it's wonderful to, you know, break those patterns, but I wouldn't say break the patterns just for the sake of breaking patterns. With it, you know, decide what it is. Again, just this is why it's great to talk with architects, right? You build your dream, not someone else's dream or not someone else's idea. To say, you know, oh, what I really want is, you know, uh, a, a beautiful, you know, maybe rammed earth, semi-sunk, super efficient home with light and and uh, you know high insulation, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, a 72 inch big screen TV, like sort of my nightmare, but that's fine. But you just say, but, I, but I, in, in the middle of this eco groovy, super hippie thing, I want a big ass TV because I love my movies. Like good on you. Do that. Right. Just make it happen. Uh, whatever, whatever your dream is, you know, do, do that uh, and see how it goes. Because it, that, that's the thing with the patterns is some patterns are good and fine. Some patterns aren't worth breaking. Uh, like, you know, who cares? Yeah, the pattern is arbitrary, but man, we're used to it and it's comfortable. And I don't see, well, I'm going to get a lot of joy out of remaking that pattern. But, you know, some, some just aren't, some, some are crazy. Uh, my, my, one of my pet peeves, I'm sure we all have them, is these open space, grand kitchen, dining room, living room things. And they just irritate me. I don't think I've ever been in one that I thought was done well. They're inhuman in scale. They're too big because usually you have three or four people in, you know, whatever, several hundred or a thousand square feet. There's everywhere, which means there's nowhere. No one knows where they're supposed to be. Everyone sort of just mills around in these ridiculously large kitchens, at, which are themselves generally not very comfortable or, or, or very well thought out. And I'm like, man, this is just what a waste of space and materials. And who who decided that we wanted to do this? That these these grand, open, unplanned, undefined, like weirdly divided spaces bring joy. Uh, I don't know. But again, banks, I think they, this is something that banks decided they would really like. But I'm not sure the people like them as much as they seem to. So that's the pattern I I'm, I'm, would be happy to see broken. But. Um, so as you ponder this, rather than think, again, rooms and materials and uh, cost and time, like was all, this is all necessary, this is all important. Um, but as with so many other projects, not just building a house, I mean, think about, you know, patterns and, and living and, you know, what would be a healthier, better version of yourself? And how could you inhabit a space that would help create that and, and reinforce that? And how in the creation of that space could you make that happen? Because it is the, the joy of, of making a space yourself 
and participating in the creation of the space is in the process of doing that. I don't think you can but help and change. You you will be changing yourself. And so I think it's worth reflecting on that in, in this philosophical sense, you know, back in the Socratic sense of saying, you know, the patterns that we live by and the patterns that we inhabit shape us. And so when we uh, articulate those patterns and help create them ourselves and participate in the creation of them, we're just reshaping ourselves. We, we can't help it. You have no choice. And so thinking about that and making the entire pattern whole, not just the conclusion that just, oh, when it's done, then, right? Like, no, no, no. If, if possible, back that up and go, I want to. And again, I think it's much clearer when you have these uh, no bank houses and you take a lot of those forces off because you're much freer to sort of get yourself in trouble and to remake yourself. You know, this is, they're, this, they're the same thing, right? The opportunity is, is to, is to go more wrong and more right, I think, which is the wonderful part about it. And, you know, if you can think about an entire pattern and go, yeah, what can I do as I'm building the house to become the kind of person who wants to inhabit the kind of house that I'm building? What does that look like? How does that make me feel? Um, how, how do I create myself in the process of creating a space for this self to inhabit? Uh, then I think the process is, again, will likely go very much better. And if you can let go of the, the ideas of efficiency, and again, I, I love the YouTube videos. You can learn so much. There's so much great material on there. But, uh, you know, the selling point, quote unquote selling points, uh, is so often about, you know, speed and efficiency and low cost materials which, you know, nothing, there's nothing wrong with the speed, efficiency, and low-cost materials. So I just think they're sort of, of of secondary or tertiary importance. Um, and it's easy once you get caught up in thinking about speed and then you start trying to cut corners and you frustrate yourself and you, you might not be happy with the conclusions. Uh, and rather than trying to think about a process that's going to let you thrive and grow in the process. Because even if you tra- tackle a relatively small, I don't know what small is the wrong word, relatively constrained, you know, maybe it's, it's uh, you know, 800 square feet or 1,000 square feet. I'm just making up random things. And it's, you know, a, a somewhat traditional frame, sort of maybe barn style, open barn, very simple, lots of light, uh, no r- rooms. There's just going to be it's a studio, just a large studio maybe sort of quasi-barn, quasi-Japanese influence or something like this. You know, even that, if it's done code-ish and, and is done mostly by you or mostly by your friends with, you know, bringing in electricians and, you know, plumbers when necessary, all this kind of stuff, it's still going to take some time and it's still going to be fairly expensive. Um, and, and rather than frustrate and drive yourself mad, you know, if you can think about the process uh, as an entire process. And, and I reflect on this because I did not do any of this when I built my house. Drove myself crazy, was overwhelmed at every step of the process, uh, literally was throwing up some mornings, which is not good. This is a sign that you're not doing it right, I think, is when you throw up with stress every morning. Uh, this is, I think, just a subtle, subtle sign, a hint that something has gone wrong. And in retrospect, I realized this was wrong in every way. Both was unnecessary, unhelpful, didn't really, you know, help advance the project, but it was mostly just a, a, a war in my own mind. And and again, as I started this process is because we're selling our house, we've sold our house, wow, and are moving, you know, part of it is we spent, you know, 20 plus years working in the garden. And the garden is is amazing now. I just love the garden. And I think back where it started from, and it just started off with just nothing, of course, because we had we cleared the woods, we did the whole thing. And but it was amazing sort of every day. I mean, when we planted little sapling trees that now are huge, the size of the house, they were amazing when they were, you know, teeny tiny. And now they're amazing. You know, we plant a rose bush. It's amazing when you plant it, it's just some sticks with thorns on it. And then it grows and it puts roses. You're like, wow. And then, you know, 10, 20, 15 years later, it's huge. And you're like, wow, now it's, you know, but so this, uh, in this notion of efficiency towards conclusion as is so often commented on, is I think um, not bad to dream about the conclusion, but just that the the conclusion is is an ongoing process. And the more you participate in it and the more you help create it, I think the greater it is for you to embrace this process and just say, hey, you know what? 
uh, every step is going to be great and finishing will be great. Like what a rare opportunity. Several people commented in the comments that, wow, you know, like I'm a student. I, won't, I don't know if I'm going to have money. I'll be able to build a house or this is crazy that people have the opportunity to do this. And I was like, yeah, it's easy to forget that. Like what a privilege it is. What a joy, what an opportunity to participate in this, to make your dream like this on this scale. And yet somehow it's easy to lose track of that. I know I did. And, and to forget like, oh, this is a, you know, like probably the biggest art project most people will undertake. And the more again you participate in it, the, the, the greater in some ways I think it is. And so whether you're going to, you know, go traditional with a bank and a builder and an architect, or you're going to go, um, be your own contractor, or you're just going to go, you know what, I'm going to do this crazy thing with round wood and mud and, you know, traditional building methods from Mongolia or whatever you've decided is the dream. Um, yeah, just, just understanding the process better, but understanding the process, not just of building, but of, of how you're participating in the process and how you want to be part of the outcome of the whole project, because it's going to be big and it's going to involve you. And if you can embrace that, I think you can make something that's often terrifying and often unnerving and, and makes people uh, stressed out. Again, certainly no, it did me. Um, in retrospect, it's unnecessary, unhelpful, and much better to think about it, um, again, more as a home, more as, oh, I'm, I'm remaking my life, and I'm as part of that, I'm creating this physical habitation. But that's only a part. It's really a reflection of my concepts, my ideas, my aesthetics, um, my, my sense of the way I would like my world to be. So I hope, I hope this was enjoyable for people. I really appreciate you uh, taking this little journey with me on this sort of sideline uh, into the world of construction and reflection on this. Um, I'm about to start a new series. I'm very excited about it. I, I hope you'll enjoy it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so thank you very much, and I can't wait for the next one.